All right. Okay, everybody, assalamu alaikum. Today we are going to talk about cholinomimetic drugs. Okay. And when we talk about cholinomimetic, the mimic word means that you're copying somebody, you're mimicking somebody, and that's how you're amplifying the action. Okay. So now when we talk about cholinomimetic receptors, that means these are those receptors which would be responsible for amplification of the cholinergic transmission. Okay. All right. So when I talk about acetylcholine, previously also we have studied that acetylcholine produces its action by uh, binding with the receptors. Okay. And when we talk about receptors, when we talk about cholinergic receptors, so we talked about that there are two kinds of receptors which we focus on. One is nicotinic receptors and one is muscarinic receptors. In this lesson, I'm again going to focus on exactly acetylcholine. Action is promoted by the muscarinic receptors, okay? Today, even we are not going to focus more on the nicotinic receptors but much more on the muscarinic receptors. Uh, okay, so uh, reinforcing this to you all again, when we talked about muscarinic receptors, by using this M, we gave it some numbers, okay? Because we know that there are five muscarinic receptors in total, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, okay? Now, when we look over here, M1, M3, M5 are on the topper side of the M, alphabet and m2 and m4 are on the lower edge of the m alphabet so we are going to uh, keep this thing in mind that m1 m3 and m5 are actually excitatory in action and m2 and m4 are inhibitory in action uh, if you try to put this logic on your paper that because m has like m1 written over there and m2 over there and that's why one is inhibitory and excitatory. So you would, of course, get no marks. Because these are just the mnemonics in order to make you memorize everything. Because pharmacology is all about memorization. All right. Uh, then we talked about that M1 and M3, okay, they increase phospholipase activity. Okay. And M2 are actually, uh, basically the muscarinic receptors are the G protein coupled receptors. I'm going to talk about these actions more in depth. If you look over here, when I, when I look at the nicotinic receptors, so they just focus on the uh, opening and closing of the sodium and potassium channels. That means that when we would deal with um, nicotinic receptors, so we would actually deal with uh, how exactly action potential is playing the game. Okay, but when we are talking about muscarinic receptors, so over here, we are more concerned about the action of G protein coupled receptors, that is GPCRs. Um, okay. Uh, before discussing this slide, uh, this one, wait a minute. Before discussing this slide, I actually want to discuss these two slides with you, and then we'll come back on this one. Okay. So you see, when we talk about GQ, all right, uh, GQ, uh, G protein coupled receptor, okay, G, G Q coupling protein, okay. So what exactly is going to do is this that first of all, see, it had alpha subunit, and uh, with the alpha subunit, it had GDP attached to it. Now what happened is GDP got converted into GDP, and as a result, it got activated, the alpha subunit. Alpha subunit went to phospholipase C. And as a result, it produced two things, right? One was, okay, uh, first of all, guys, C. When I say, when I say phospholipase, so you say ACE, right? ACE means it's an enzyme, all right? So this is an enzyme within the cell membrane, okay? So what happens is this, that it produces DAG and IP3. What is IP3? IP3 is inositol 1,4,5-triphosphate, okay? And what is this here? DAG, this is diacylglycerol, okay? 
all right and as a result you see it's pr producing its action all right it what it did what it converted protein kinase c into activated version and then it's converted the stored calcium into the free calcium and then all of the activities have started to happen right let's go back to our slide all right this one see m1 m3 worked with the gq coupled protein they enhance phospholipase c activity and that's why more of the ip3 more of the dag was produced and as a result more of the calcium was produced you see over here ip3 is inositol 145 triphosphate okay and dag is diacyl glycerol all right um then is this one here you see we have two kinds of g proteins here one is gs other one is gi now this gs is stimulatory and this gi is inhibitory and again you see over here this is the main hero of this entire process which is adenylyl cyclase all right now again ace is there it means it's an enzyme you can see that it is within the membrane okay all right so you see first of all let's talk about the stimulatory effect of it all right what would happen if an agonist drug would bind if an agonist ligand would bind uh, as a result this alpha subunit would get activated by having this gdp converted into gtp and as a result it would go to adenylyl cyclase and as a result more more of the cyclic amp would be produced by using atp right okay when cyclic amp would be produced then as a result you see the entire i in my video when i uh, discussed g protein couple receptors i talked more in depth about it okay so you see the entire actions would happen right okay now talk about the inhibitory effect when any ligand would bind which would produce inhibitory effect so what would happen this this gi would be activated here gs was activated which was enhancing the cyclic amp production but when gi which is inhibitory g protein would be activated then all of the stimulatory actions would be inhibited right okay so you see this gi has again alpha subunit and on this alpha subunit you see this gdp is attached which is converted into gtp the alpha subunit got activated it went to adenylyl cyclase and it told adenylyl cyclase to inhibit its activity when it inhibited the activity so obviously the cyclic amp production was diminished and along with it increased potassium ion conductance were there which produced hyperpolarization you see over here gi decreased adenylyl cyclase activity and decreased cyclic amp clear everybody okay now coming up over here we in this uh, slide we talked about that m1 m3 m5 are producing excitatory effect right now i want you to look at this slide and look at what exactly m1 m3 and m5 have the uh, second messengers m1 ip3 dag enhanced okay m3 ip3 dag enhanced m5 ip3 dag enhanced you see everybody it is the same thing so you don't uh, um, if you would look at this table instantaneously you would think oh my god how am i going to memorize this thing but it's not difficult at all if you understand the logic behind it okay then m2 and m4 you see cyclic amp diminished and direct coupling to potassium channels like i just told you all and again an m4 cyclic amp is diminished okay now 
we are going to talk about the actions that it produces and when you view my entire slide where the actions the pharmacological actions are discussed even these responses and their site of action is not difficult for you to memorize at all um, so you can always get back to this slide once the lecture is finished okay <clears throat> now talking about the location so you see muscarinic receptors like i've just told you all at the start of the lesson that muscarinic receptors are of five types m1 m2 m3 and m5 now let's talk about their location okay so this m1 is actually in the sympathetic postganglionic neuron all right m2 is more on the cardiac and smooth muscle okay m3 are found in glandular secretion glandular secretion uh basically it enhances the acidity and you know lacrimation and everything and the vascular endothelium and vascular smooth muscle okay m5 receptors are present in vascular endothelium all of the five receptors of units including m4 receptors are found in pns neurons um my upcoming slide would actually tell you how exactly these are producing its action so let's jump to the next slide all right now you guys see over here here we talked about the entire actions and here we are going to elaborate it further i want you all to cram up this slide literally cram up this slide like produce a wall on your room okay and like if you take out the screenshot of it so just you know take take out the print out and attach it on the wall or maybe uh, produce a booklet of yours where you are attaching these kind of tables and then you are memorizing like you are writing this entire tables every day early in the morning so um, i think it would help to retain secondly what you can do is this uh, you can um, save all of these slides as snapshot in your google drive and um, whenever you're traveling from one place to another and if you're not driving so of course you can review these slides like every day okay uh, when i was a student so um, my home to university distance was almost 25 minutes so i remember i used to um, you know view my notes every day so that um, i would retain all of these concepts in my mind all right now you guys see over here when we talk about the eye so i is sphincter is here and the ciliary muscle um sphincter are the circular muscles in the iris i hope you have watched my video which is uh, which i have already shared with you all related to the eye structure <coughs> okay so the circular muscles would contract and meiosis would be produced ciliary muscles ciliary muscles remember those muscles which are attached um which are attached to the um, which are controlling the movement of the lens by the help of the sensory ligaments okay so you see its contraction would create accommodation for near vision okay talk about sa node and av node guys i want you to notice one thing here that is you see over here it's written no effect on ventricle right it means that ventricles are not having effect at all what do i mean by ventricles are not having effect at all what do ventricles actually do ventricles contract in order to pump the blood right so when i would say that ventricles are having no effect at all so that means how with how much force the heart is going to contract with how much force the ventricles are going to contract it's not controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system right okay so what this m2 does here is this the sa node and av node are there right okay so it will decrease the heart rate negative chronotropic effect negative conduction which is the negative dromotropic effect then is we talk about lungs so you see in the lungs the bronchioles would actually contract producing bronchospasm and the glands would over secrete and that's why the the mucus secretion would be there 
right? Okay. Then in the GIT tract, you see in the stomach, increase motility or cramps would be there. And in the glands, increased secretion would be there again. In intestine, contraction would be there, which would produce diarrhea and involuntary defecation, right? What are they? We are going to talk again, okay? All right, then bladder. In bladder, you see contraction of the bladder muscles, okay, which is called detrusors, and relaxation of trigone sphincter, that is voiding, urinary incontinence, which means that the urine would be passed on without uh, our will. Sphincters would relax except lower esophageal, which contracts. Okay. Now, talking about glands, glands would secrete over, and they would do overproduction. Okay. When you talk about normal conditions, okay, they would produce in a normal quantity the sweat and lacrimation and salivation, but just imagine I'm, I have already taken a cholinomimetic drug. Now what would happen? If I have taken a cholinomimetic drug, for, see, there are two conditions, right? One condition is this, that I was going through um, dryness, all right? I had no saliva in my mouth. I had no tears in my eyes. I had no sweat at all. So I, doctor actually prescribed me this drug, right? So that this drug now would bring me to the normal condition, right? But what if I don't have any of these situations and I just took the pill? So what would happen? Of course, I would sweat more, okay? I would salivate more and I would lacrimate more, right? Okay, now talking about the blood vessels, that is endothelium. We have talked again um, about it, that it produces dilation, right? And if you look over here, it's written no innervation. It means that nerves are not going to produce the neurotransmitters at all. In fact, there is an indirect effect. What's indirect effect? We are going to talk about it. Okay. So as I told you previously that we will uh, talk about these effects more like quickly, not in that depth. So you see, meiosis, it's all about the constriction of the pupil, right? So you see, as I've told you in my previous videos as well, that you see the circular muscle is contract and that's why the pupil size decreases and this is meiosis, right? Okay. Now, um, that day I told you all that when the circular muscles are contracting, so at that moment, you are accommodating your eyes more for the closer object vision, right? So if the drug, if a muscarinic receptor is being activated, so the ciliary muscles would contract more and more. Okay. Inotropic, dromotropic, and chronotropic effects. Let's, let's talk about it very quickly, not that much, that much in depth. Now, you see, chrono means time, tropo means turn, right? So it is actually, if you look over here, parasympathetic actually has uh, the heart rate in a normal amount, okay? Now, when it's sympathetic stimulation, so over here, th these are a lot of heartbeats, right? But if you look over here, uh, in the normal resting state, it is that much, right? So uh, a normal heart heartbeat would actually take 0 0.8 seconds, right? A normal heartbeat takes 0 0.8 seconds. Now, if I'm taking parasympathetic stimulation is there, right? So it would put me, what is parasympathetic? Parasympathetic is rest and digest kind of a state, right? Now, if I'm taking a drug which is enhancing, which is amplifying my parasympathetic system, so obviously my body would go more into the rest and digest phase, and that's why the heartbeat would get less and even more, right? So you see, uh, like in the normal resting state, a heartbeat was taking, 0 0.8 seconds to happen but over here is taking almost like 1 or 1.2 seconds right so that's a lot of difference uh, because you see in 2.4 in the normal condition here three heartbeats were taking place and here like not even two fully like one and a half 
heartbeat took place. Okay, domotropy. What is domotropy? Okay, when we talk about over here, this here, you see the SA node, right? The SA node is actually responsible for the heartbeat, right? When we talk about dromotropic effect, so dromotropic effect is more dependent on the AV, AV node, okay? A dromotropic agent is one which affects the conduction speed, all right? So in the AV node and subsequently the rate of electrical impulses in the heart is being controlled. When ACH decreases, AV node contraction velocity, M2, happens, okay? And you see the entire thing is here, increased permeability, and everything is here. <clears throat> uh, inotropic effect. Okay, inotropic effect, I'm introducing this term to you, but we're not uh, going to uh, use this term in the muscarinic receptors. Why not? Because we have already talked about it, that uh, the ventricles are not involved in the parasympathetic system, right? They are not actually innervated by them. So you see over here, what is inotropic effect? Inotropic is effect is actually that how, with how much push the ventricles are contracting, okay? With how much force the ventricles are contracting. So you see, inotropy refers to ability of the heart to contract, generate, generate force to a given fiber length, okay? And then, you know, calcium is associated with it and everything. Okay. Then we talked about that it produces bronchospasm. Now, what is bronchospasm? Wait a minute. What is bronchospasm? A spasm of uh, bronchial smooth muscles producing narrowing of the bronchi. If you look over here, the smooth muscles are there, which are relaxed. But if you look over here, they're tightened up. Okay. So you have to keep this picture in mind and you have to know that whenever bronchospasm happens, okay, whenever muscarinic receptors are there producing its impact, so at that moment, the smooth muscles would get really tightened up. Furthermore, we have discussed about this previously as well, that uh, these medications would actually produce a lot of mucus, okay? And as a result, when a lot of mucus would be produced, so you see there would be wheezing, right? Um, the person would have difficulty to breathe as well, okay? All right. Now, over here, I said mucus would be secreted, right? So how exactly mucus would be secreted? You see over here, these are called goblet cells, okay? So these goblet cells actually produce mucus, all right? And this is cilia over here, which trap the dust particles. So this is how the ciliated epithelium looks like. And the epithelium is actually covering up the entire respiratory tract, starting from the nostrils, ending to the uh, the alveoli part. All right, so it's like very much coated with the epithelial cells. Urinary bladder. We have already talked about it. That it produces urinary incontinence. So that means that um, you see the ureters and the bladder wall is going to contract, and the sphincter is going to relax which would actually push, push the urine through the bladder. You see, that's how it works. Okay. We have talked about the GI uh, sphincters, okay? So you see, over here, this is the lower esophageal sphincter, which would contract. Because if you, if you remember my previous slide, uh, the first slide where, which, where I have had the entire action elaborated and summarized at one place. So it mentioned that the lower esophageal sphincter would contract, okay? So this is the one lower sphincter which would contract. You see, why Why do you want it to be contracted? Because the acid reflux won't be there. If it's relaxed, so acid reflux is there, okay? Okay, by the way, this, this condition, where acid reflux is there, it is called GERD, okay? What is GERD? This is gastroesophageal reflux disease, where the reflux is there, okay? Then is the blood vessels to dilate. Remember, we talked about it, and here is the indirect action. If you remember in my uh, first slide where I had all of the 
action summarized at one place. I talked that they produce indirect effect, right? So what is the indirect effect? You see, first of all, you have to remember that M3 is there, right? M3 is there by which the acetylcholine would bind. And then you see it would produce uh, nitric oxide and then it would diffuse inside, which would help to convert GTP into CGMP. And this is the molecule which actually produced relaxation, okay? So this is the entire process of it. Promote the release of nitric oxide, which diffuses to the vascular smooth muscle to activate uh, this uh, uh, enzyme and then increase the site G CGMP and then to produce relaxation. All right. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. See you again.